All right, welcome to our men's health pa panel, Brothers in Battle, Breaking Down Stigmas Around Men's Health in Cancer and Mental Health, uh, Cancer's Impact on Mental Health. You will see I'm the most beautiful person on this panel, um, which I look exactly like my name is. People tell me often that I look like a Justin Berkbuckler, and that's what you're seeing on your screen right now. Um, because for whatever reason, um, much like my own testicles, I've kind of dropped the ball on my own internet connection. So you will be able to hear my sultry tunes. Uh, but to get us started, uh, we're going to be having a lively conversation, as I'm sure, throughout this evening. I've gathered my uh, avengers of cancer survivors, if you will. Um, and often, actually, a lot of us do have some exposure to radiation, so that metaphor actually works. Um, so we're going to go around the horn here and just take one minute to introduce ourselves. Rick, just to clarify, that is 60 U.S. seconds. Um, so I will be timing and I will cut, uh, clock people off. So I'm just kidding. I won't really cut you off. But anyways, we will start with the lefty to my righty, Kyle Smith. Tell us who, who are you, Kyle? What do you do? Your diagnosis and so on and so forth. 60 seconds starts now. All right. Uh, I expect some orchestral music to play me off the stage when my 60 seconds are up. 55 seconds. Uh, Okay. Uh, my name's Kyle Smith. Um, in 2012, I was diagnosed with stage one testicular cancer. Um, and then about a year later, I started Check 15, which is a cancer awareness YouTube channel. Uh, over the course of the past five and a half years, we've made, I think, 69 uh, cancer awareness videos. And um, I have a f background in filmmaking and I live in Los Angeles. I work in the film industry. Um, so I've approached cancer awareness from that side. Um, and we approach, uh, cancer awareness through humor and, uh, education through entertainment. Um, we make a lot of parodies and, uh, comedy sketches and I, I think they're pretty good. And if you haven't checked them out, I hope you do after this is done, of course. Um, so yeah. All right. Thank you, Kyle. And you hit the minute pretty much right on Mark. We will go, uh, to the back door now here and let's check in with Rick Davis. Your minute begins now, which let's see if he can stick to it. Hi, Rick Davis. As you already know, um, I was diagnosed back in 2007 with stage three, a prostate cancer. Did a lot of treatment um, that included uh, radiation and two and a half years of hormone therapy, um, which um, finished up with me speaking like this. Um, but then after I finished, uh, my voice returned to pretty much how you hear it right now. Um, we run a, a nonprofit called ANCAN, A-N-C-A-N, ANCAN.org. Um, and our main activity there are virtual groups, uh, virtual su peer-led support groups. Uh, we don't yet have a testicular cancer group, but as uh, the Kyle and Justin know, we've been working on that for a couple of years and we're getting closer. Um, and basically that's, that's my initial story. And I am impressed you actually took less time than Kyle. I thought this day would never come. Uh, but thank you, Rick, for joining us. And I'm just going around the way it is on my screen. So next up, we've got Tr Taylor. Guys from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a stage three colon cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer back in July of 2012. I've been seven years cancer free since that time. I'm on a contracting business here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm the host of the 1% Podcast, which is a podcast where I interview cancer warriors, survivors, caregivers, and providers in order to provide everyone with you know, some positivity around a cancer diagnosis. It doesn't have to be all bad, no matter what circumstance that you're in or where you're at in the journey. And I love the power of storytelling. I love how storytelling heals. So the 1% Podcast um, has been open, man, since September of last year, we've got thousands of downloads all over the world and I'm super excited to be with you guys tonight. 
Awesome. Thank you very much, Truett. And Truett um, does host an excellent podcast. There's one episode that really stands out above all the others as the best one, but I'm not going to make him say which one it is. Um, but if you listen, you'll know. Um, and last, but certainly not least, especially seeing as, as it is October and Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I've um, actually I've met John virtually about a year ago, I think. Um, so I'm happy to introduce John. Why don't you take it away with your introduction? Well, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I am a two-time male breast cancer survivor, and uh, I'm retired from the Chicagoland area. Um, oh, golly. Uh, and uh, it's really important for me to get the word out. That's really my main focus right now because uh, we're kind of unicorns as breast cancer survivors. There's not many of us. And I always like to joke, I'm going to start a male breast cancer survivor group, and it's going to be me and another guy. So I'm very interested to see what we learn here tonight. Well, thank you all for sharing your story. And Rick, it sounds like that was an open invitation to, for him to host a male breast cancer support group. So, you know, take him up on that. Um, so this evening, I just kind of want to go around. Uh, really, I want to focus in on two topics. Number one. Uh, men's health in general. And then after that, I want to talk about something that affects men that um, and all cancer survivors and patients really mental health. Um, so I want a free flowing dialogue, but to just kind of get us started here. And this isn't directed at anyone. Anyone can jump in once I'm done. Um, so before you were diagnosed with your respective cancer type, how proactive were you in your own health? I'll, I'll start just to spark the conversation. I actually hadn't been to the doctor for three years prior to being diagnosed. Um, I was the quintessential, I felt fine. I didn't really think I needed to. Um, and it was only because I detected a lump, the only reason I went. But, you know, I'd be sick and I would refuse to go to the doctor because I just didn't think it was something that was important. So who wants to chime in to share what they, how they took care of their health before? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so for me, I was actually um, into amateur kickboxing. I just had a fight in December, and I'd lost a little bit of weight because that's what happens when you get to training so hard. And I had a little bit of abdominal pain. That was the only sign that I had. Uh, I was in great shape, but never in a million years I think I would get diagnosed with stage three colon cancer at 31 years old. So don't all jump in at once. Yeah, okay, dead air. We don't like dead air. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I have to say that um, I too uh, was not too diligent, Justin, so, so don't be alone. Um, as um, some of you listening may know, uh, it's pretty smart to start getting PSA tests. Um, if you don't, if you're, if you're not in an at-risk group, at age 45, um, and certainly um, at age 50. Uh, I actually got a test when the test first came out, which was in 19... Uh, and um, we'll just move on from there. And um, I actually was at risk, um, but I never really checked myself again for many years, and then... Um, when I did check myself, uh, I had a big issue. So I think the key here, uh, and it's a good topic, Justin, is that for certain cancers um, like colon, like prostate, uh, where it is pretty easy to get tested, you should be diligent about getting tested because early diagnosis um, can save your life. Absolutely, and I think that's something we're all uh, very passionate about. Kyle, John, anything you want to chime in with? Yeah, I can chime in. Um, I was I was 26, almost 27 years old when I was diagnosed and when I found the lump. Um, so prior to that, I had been doing my uh, yearly um, regular exams with my um, general practitioner um, because I was on my parents' insurance. So why not? Um, and uh, everything had been fine up until then. And honestly, even when I was, um, even when I felt felt the lump, um, I felt perfectly fine. Um, I had two days after finding the lump, I ran the Chicago Marathon, and it's still my personal record. Um, so it, I think it's important to even 
go see the doctor and be proactive about your health, even when you're feeling fine. Um, you know, the thing that we talk about a lot with check 15 and, and the, we put a lot of importance on early detection. Um, so it is important to know, um, about screenings and just staying on top of your health. And, uh, especially if you're feeling sick, go get it checked out. Let me just uh, jump in and I can tell you, for me, uh, I have uh, epilepsy. I haven't had a grand mal seizure in 20 years, so I've always been aware of my health. Uh, I take medications to keep that in control and low blood pressure. So uh, I would always get uh, yearly uh, checkups with the doctor. I was never afraid to go um, and so when I found my lump, I was running to that doctor to figure out what it was. But for men, truly, a lot of guys don't want to go to the doctor. My son won't go. Uh, you know, my brother doesn't go. And so for me, that's the critical thing is uh, early detection, as you said, for men and breast cancer and all of it, you need to get yourself checked if something's wrong, a lump, something that you know your body, if something's out of place, you need to go get it checked out. And for male breast cancer, there's a lot of embarrassment over it. Guys don't wanna talk about it. Uh, when I found mine, I wanted to tell everybody. And I called work and I told my sergeant, I'm having surgery, it's breast cancer. I want you to tell everybody at work and I'll be back. So. That was really important for me. So that, John, I want to go a little further with that and then everybody here. So that when I talked to you last year, that was something that was amazing to me, how you, you wanted to tell, you know, your coworkers. So what, what really sparked you, your decision to open up and, you know, go on this crusade and everybody will get a chance to share that. But what was the turning point that made you want to say, you know, I don't want to be another guy who goes through some sort of health thing and keep it to myself? That's a really good question. Um, I think, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know what? I think I'm just wired differently. Honestly, uh, I... <laughs> I just knew when I got it, I knew that I had to tell everybody. I, it, and it was in October, November when I was diagnosed and had my surgery. So I was looking around and saying, okay, everything is about pink ribbons. There's nothing about men. And I was puzzled by it and thought, no, I have to start telling. And so I had a shirt made, uh, it said breast cancer, men get it too. I have a new one and I'm wearing it, it says, men get breast cancer, ask me how I know. And so I was telling everybody. And last year I got written up uh, on your site and I'm so thankful. This year I stood up on a Chicago River tour at the end and said, I have an announcement to make everybody, men get breast cancer. Please check yourself, check your moods. And that's really what I have been doing is just getting the word out any way I can. And it's just something that came natural to me. That is, that is quite the ballsy approach there. I do very much appreciate that. Um, I, if, if you're keeping record, I believe that's a, about the pun I've dropped. John, real quick, we do have a question from the audience. Um, they're, they're interested in what seizure meds you take if you're willing to share um, because the person asked the question had grand mal seizures in uh, 2004 in 2006, and they've been on uh, Lamictal for th uh, 13 years. Yes, uh, Lamictal is what I take. <coughs> Pardon me. And you know what? There's one more that I take, and I can't remember what it is. Uh, but I do take I do take Lamictal. I think Kepra is another name for it, uh, and it has controlled my seizures very well. But my seizure disorder is not severe, and that's the other thing. So I'm lucky. Yeah. Oh, very good. Thank you for answering that. Who, who wants to chime in next on why they decided to open up? I think um, with, yeah. um, you know, that's the main reason I started the podcast that I host because whenever I was 
going through my cancer diagnosis, I really didn't have anyone to talk to. I remember you know, being in my doctor's office, maybe on like my third or fourth round of chemo and just completely breaking down to her because I didn't feel comfortable talking with anyone about how I was emotionally feeling about being diagnosed at such a young age. Um, we talk a lot about in the colon cancer community that you're never too young to get tested. And, you know, when you're diagnosed in your early thirties, you're still figuring out who you are. And it's, you know, I, of all the people that I've interviewed on the show, a lot of the men that I talk to, you know, it's the, there's a mask of, of masculinity that we have to, to keep things to ourselves, to not share, um, especially with other men, but other females as well, too, um, about the situations that we're going through. And I think it's just part of society for men to have that tough outer layer. And that's a stigma that I think all of us are breaking down today by talking to so many people right now that, you know, we really have to open up and be vulnerable enough to share what's really going on with us, whether it's a support group, a friendship, um, you know, with your spouse you know, with a, with a group of guys like this, I think that's really important for us to continue to keep getting the word out for all different types of cancers because you know, cancer has a way of making you feel embarrassed, like you did something wrong. That's why you have it and you're less than maybe as a man, but that's completely untrue. So I think the more we talk about it, the more we'll all be able to establish, you know, keep our masculine identity, obviously, but really be able to establish more comfortability from just being vulnerable. I think that was very well put, Kyle. And I, I know you chimed in at the same time as Tripp. Yeah, I mean, what I was just going to say is um, something you talk a lot about, Justin, and that's, um, I know you've done polls on this, that w when I found my testicular cancer, I had never been told to be doing monthly self-exams. Um, and that pissed me off a little bit. So I knew that I personally needed to use my experience to get the world word out there. Yep. That's definitely uh, very, very important. And you do it in a very artistic, but tasteful way. Uh, Rick, anything to add? Not really. I mean, I, I think prostate cancer is probably a, a little bit different. Um, because it is so widespread um, amongst um, men only, uh, and because self-examination is uh, is a little difficult, um, <laughs> as, as you can imagine. Um, I mean, you just have to be diligent, and uh, you you have to start getting tested uh, at least uh, with a blood test. Um, for me, uh, even though I was diagnosed stage three, uh, I never felt intimidated or threatened, fortunately, by the cancer. It was what it was. I just had to deal with it. And uh, it came very naturally to me to become an advocate. Um, so I, you know, I'm not, I don't find myself so much in the situation, um, say, that Truett found himself in. Um, probably more like John, where uh, it was just important to get the message out that if you diagnose early, and, and all men are at risk for prostate cancer, if you diagnose early, then it's a very manageable disease. And I think that's so important, even though we all have different motivations for why we just started to speak up. We all have the same common goal. is We, we want to educate men specifically and to help them to talk. And so that, that goes into the next topic I want to talk about is, you know, we have a why, but how or what have you found is the best way to get conversation flowing, especially with men who don't want to talk about their health. In my case, I use a lot of humor because I've noticed that that works as a natural connector, kind of an icebreaker. And then, you know, kind of going off what John said about standing up on the boat, I've literally gone up to guys when I was in, uh, on in line for Alcatraz, there were three Irish guys and I made some sort of ball related joke and then told them how to do a self exam and then finished it up uh, with another joke. And, you know, that's, that's what works for me, but I'm curious what works for each of you guys. We can have Kyle start on this one if he's okay with that. Sure. Um, 
So like I said, we make cancer awareness videos. Um, I always say I grew up a, a PBS kid. So, um, so I, I know the value of entertaining education and that's what we try to do with check 15. Um, we try to make cancer awareness fun and, uh, easy to watch. Um, whether it's working, I don't know. Uh, not that many people watch our videos. Uh, but I think the people that do really enjoy them. Uh, and I've been told by the people that watch them that they are more proactive about their health. So I think it's working in that, uh, respect. Sure, not to put you on the spot, but I think you would be a great next candidate to talk. <laughs> no, no particular reason I chose you to draw attention to your screen. <laughs> um, for me, I think just men-related events that I'm on. Um, like I have a softball team, and what I've done is I've taken some of the um, picture tutorials that you have about testicular exams, and I'll send it out at the beginning of every season like hey it's a good time before we you know start hitting these balls to check your balls or something like that so um i think just sharing available resources that we have which for me there's there's there can never be enough resources for men um is to share them whenever you have and like a fitting opportunity i think as well um so for me that's been one moment that i've been able to share with um a lot of my social circle around here is during like big events where it's just guy events like that getting together. And um, it's really, you know, we've had some guys definitely take advantage of that and um, ask a lot of questions from it too, which all those questions kind of lead into, you know, if you know someone that kind of gets funneled your way as well too, like this is a guy who talks about cancer a lot. And I've had a lot of opportunities for people that, that, you know, have promoted the podcast through different people that you've met. Like, Hey, there's a guy who has a cancer show. And, you know, if, if you want to talk to someone, he's a perfect person to talk to. So I think just honestly, you know, we're all passionate about what we do. We're all passionate about, you know, the mental health side of this and getting the awareness out for each one of our cancers. So the more we continue to talk about it with everyone and um, just not being afraid to get out there and making yourself look like a fool if you need to or whatever draws attention, I think, just whatever your personality is, is the best thing for you. I think you hit on two very important points there. Um, using your own natural talents for what you're into like Kyle with his videos. Um, but then I think the other point is going where the guys already are, you know, don't make them go out of the way. That's a big thing. Oh, there's been various studies that show that guys don't want to talk about their health because it, or do take care of the health because it's inconvenient. So go where they are like the softball team, um, John or Rick, anything, if you have something to add, you can give that up. Oh, John, take it away. Yes. Um, I don't want to gush too much. This really opens my eyes and gives me more ideas. My thing is really uh, standing up on a boat and telling everyone men can get breast cancer, uh, working with my doctor to be connected to you and tell my story. Uh, I'm trying to balance not being all about the cancer and really driven to get the word out and use some humor to do so. Uh, I mean, I put stickers in the men's room that say men get breast cancer. It sounds crazy at the urinal, uh, at Target or wherever, just because the next guy that walks up sees that and they're going to go, oh, and people are receptive to me, you know, especially this month with my shirt on, talking to them and saying, you know, check your body, do a self check the way women do. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, it's... It's just something I can't stop doing. And I'm looking for other ways. In the state of Illinois, I got the number of somebody at the Department of Motor Vehicles, and I'm trying to get them to issue a state-issued male breast cancer plate. Only a few guys are going to get them, but another way to put that word out. And one more thing, they're putting pink lights all over Chicago's buildings downtown. I have to find out who's in charge of that and put some blue lights to. Um, yeah, I, 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 I like your, um, excuse the pun, ballsy approach, uh, uh, John, um, because 
it, for you, it is an issue that uh, people forget that that breast cancer that breast cancer affects men too. Um, we actually do have a, a, a virtual group uh, that we run with Peggy Miller, who you probably know, uh, with with um, Male Breast Cancer Coalition. Maybe you'll come on that group one of these days. Um, I have to say, I'm pretty lax on the awareness side. Um, we most of what we focus on in terms of uh, bre uh, prostate cancer uh, advocacy um, really relates to people that are already diagnosed. Uh, we don't we don't do a heck of a lot of work, and I don't do a heck of a lot of work of, of work uh, on on awareness. Um, I think that the prostate cancer we know it affects a significant part of the population, about 40% of men at age 40, 50% of men at age 50, 60% of men at age 60, and that continues right the way up. So everybody knows they're at risk. Um, the issue with prostate cancer is, are you gonna get yourself tested? Do you wanna deal with the results of the test? And um, what, where I have focused more um, and our nonprofit is focused more is in supporting men once they're once they're diagnosed. And that does Rick. I, I think I don't I didn't even send you guys my questions, but you guys are doing a great job of segueing me into my next thing. Um, so the the other part I want to talk about is the mental health side of things. And Rick, we're gonna start with you here is Cancer definitely has a huge impact on mental health. I'll speak for myself. I went through very, I've gone through depression earlier in life, but then I realized I was going back into depression a year after I was done with cancer. And then recently I found out that it was actually PTSD instead of just depression. Um, so that's been the impact of cancer on my mental health. But Rick, we'll start with you. What's been the impact of cancer on your mental health? Well, that in, with respect to prostate cancer, that's a very complex question. The reason being that um, if you are diagnosed with a more advanced uh, or, or, or a higher stage level of prostate cancer, then uh, you are the the treatment is likely to induce uh, depression. Um, so it's going to cause mental health issues, and we're very much aware of that. Uh, now, this isn't true if you have simple disease um, where you can be basically one and done, treated with either radiation or surgery. Uh, the disease is not recurrent. But again, with prostate cancer, about 35% of, uh, of all men find that they're wrestling with recurrent disease. And once they start wrestling with recurrent disease, they have to start considering hormone therapy. And with hormone therapy, for many men comes the risk of, uh, of depression. Um, so in my own particular case, um, I have a long history of depression. It's a family history. Um, it goes back a couple of generations before me, and I've suffered from depression for many, many years. So I feel I was very fortunate in that the depression that came about through the treatment, um, the, the lack of testosterone in my body, um, I was pretty able to deal with because I knew and understood what was happening. The, the, the problem I perceive with um, mental health comorbidities is that if people have never suffered before and they're suddenly hit with anxiety or depression or whatever it is, then it becomes exaggerated. Uh, once you're used to it and you've dealt with it, it's much easier the second time it comes about. And so the, the big um, advice point that I have is to seek peer support, to talk to other people that have had the disease, have wrestled with these issues, who are, who are willing to be there for you. And if you need to be medicated, don't be scared of medication. Don't 
um, uh, seek the medication rather than avoid the medication. I definitely agree. I think you uh, done an excellent job with explaining that. And Rick, to your point about how your history with depression helped you, that's something that I, I always, with my history, I noticed the signs earlier. And so I think, I think the more we do talk about mental health in general will help regardless of diagnosis, pre-diagnosed, not diagnosed, help understand the signs. Um, who, who wants to jump in next? Well, I'll jump in. Uh, again, I am different. I'm, I'm wired differently from most people. Uh, when I found out I had breast cancer, and this is the truth, uh, I wasn't afraid. I never cried. I never said, why me? And I'm such a positive person that when I found out, I, I just said to myself, you know what? I've got this. I caught it early. I was so sure. And I didn't will it away. But I did catch it early. My margins were clean. They didn't take lymph nodes. I didn't have chemo. I didn't have wrenching treatment. And when it came back again, it was the same thing for me. And right from the start, I wanted to tell everyone about it. But if it had been a different outcome, uh, Rick, I think you're absolutely right. <clears throat> I would have gone through depression. Although I always say, if it was a different output, that I would deal with it and I would make the best of it. We all try to do that. So I can't imagine really, because I didn't go through chemo, what that would be like. But uh, I think that personally, I could handle it and get through pretty well. I have like a two part, I have a positive and negative answer to that question. For me, um, after talking to so many people, I've seen both sides of what cancer can do to your mental health. I think one thing is people don't realize that whenever cancer comes in, it hits you right in the middle of everything, whether it's right after a divorce, right with a job promotion, wherever it's at. So you're just kind of stuck where you're at. You can't get prepared for cancer mentally. And there's really no blueprint afterwards either. Once you have cancer, you kind of just have to navigate it from wherever you're at. And I see people go through the grief cycle and just like any other traumatic event, we can all, we can get stuck in one of the stages of the grief cycle. And so when you get to that point, I feel like it's great to have people around you to help navigate you through that rough period because, you know, you may be able to do better as you continue to go along with that rough patch that you have. So for me, like the two answers that I have would be number one, you know, for, for me, it caused more anxiety, I would say. Um, every time you go to a doctor's appointment or that six month, that one year checkup, that scan anxiety that we always get with that time where the doctor's taking too long, you know, he could be at lunch, but we're all thinking he's just going to come back in here and tell me I have cancer again or something along those lines. So I think the anxiety portion for me has been a new thing to deal with because I didn't really feel like that before. But the other answer to that as well, too, is I feel like from a mental health standpoint that cancer has really opened up my life in a very positive way because I'm more intentional with everything I do now as well, too. So how I live my life, the relationships that I have, the people that I communicate with, the job that I have, all of those things, I'm much more intentional about the choices that I make because cancer kind of woke me up as well too and said, hey, you're, you're wasting a lot of your life worrying about what other people think or trying to reach a, a selfish goal. You really should you know, focus on what's most important in your life, the people around you, the things that you're really passionate about. So for me, those are kind of the both sides of what cancer's done from a mental health standpoint. And like I said, there's no blueprint for mental health. And it's great that we're all talking about this right now because hopefully some people are getting, you know, that feeling they're not alone because that's one thing I hear from a lot of people as well too is when, when you're laying on, on your pillow at night and you're, and you're there and no one's there around you, it's just you and your cancer diagnosis or you and your survivorship. So I think it's really important for everyone to not feel alone and be able to communicate about everything they're going through. I, I definitely agree. And I, I like that you brought up positive and negative aspects of mental health because me as well, I've had positive and 
negative aspects from it. So Kyle, you have anything you want to try add? Yeah, I mean, the one thing um, that I would add is, you know, cancer, um, a lot of people describe it as kind of like giving you a new lease on life or at least a new perspective, um, especially being diagnosed young. Um, it's not something a lot of younger people and young adults experience. Um, and uh, I've always had really lofty ambitions and goals and then having cancer and gaining that new perspective just kind of put more pressure on those lofty ambitions and goals. Um, so that's where I feel it the most as far as mental health is concerned is um, I know we're all on uh, limited time and um, you never know when that time's gonna be up. Um, so it's it's been, it's been challenging to deal with that concept and uh, attempt to achieve those goals. Um, sometimes I wish that I were achieving things faster um, because I know that life's a ticking clock. Um, so that's, that's been the toughest part for me as far as um, cancer kind of, compounding upon my uh, mental health issues. Just, um, Justin, I just want to jump in with one other point here um, from a mental health standpoint, which is that if um, you find yourself facing a, uh, a cancer diagnosis, uh, I think it's really, really um, important for your own mental well-being to to seek out peer support because people that have been through the disease before you uh, have a lot of experience and it's a different experience to to what you find uh, when you go to the doctor um, when you speak to medical professionals um, that there are some great folks out there um, willing to give a lot of their time and energy to support people that are coming down the path after them and anxious to remove a lot of the rocks and the pebbles that are on that path so you don't trip over them. And so if there's one thing to take away from this panel, it is to seek peer support. I 100% I agree. I, that's one thing. Kyle, I've said this to you a couple of times, but I'll say it again. You were one of the first people to reach out to me when I went public with my diagnosis. And while we kind of bantered in the beginning a lot back and forth, it, it was helpful, even if we didn't necessarily talk about that stuff up front, to see someone ahead of, ahead of the game. And I think peer support, and I think also to... I think professional support also has been something. I go to a therapist every other week now, and whether I talk about cancer or just life, I think that that's been one thing that's really helped me to cope, um, which kind of leads into the next part. And some of you have already touched on this um, as you're talking about this. Is what, what have you found that is helped you cope with the, these new mental health challenges? For me, it's things like going to a therapist and, and I find a lot of strength in numbers, like talking out on social media about the impact of mental health and just talking with other people. And, uh, you know, one of the sponsors of GVCC, uh, today, Bristol Myers Squibb has been doing a lot of great work with their survivorship today program. Um, and I've been very fortunate to work with them on that and just get connected with more people. So, Yes, Rick, definitely peer-to-peer -peer support is so huge. Uh, professional support, and I love you mentioned, don't, don't be afraid to do medication if that's something that you need. Um, but what are some other things that have helped you guys um, cope with your different mental health challenges? Well, I'll, I'll say uh, real quick, just about the last question. Uh, I didn't mention this. Um, the second time I had it, uh, I realized that 
the cancer was a thing for me. The first time it was a surgery, it was done, no chemo, nothing. So I did realize uh, that this was a thing. And then further, it was something I never thought of. Once you have cancer, you always have it and it could come back. And it never, I never thought about it. I still don't really think about it coming back. Uh, and then real quick, the other question that you just said, because I want to cover that as far as, you know, what you gentlemen just answered, the question you just answered, is that about support? Yeah, it's what, what are things, um, what, what has helped you to either find support or cope with mental health challenges? <clears throat> um, I did get a I did get a little sad, uh, when I realized that I'm a cancer survivor uh, and that it could come back. And then of course, going to three different doctors every three months and having to do that to follow up. So for me, really being able to talk about it with others and tell others and use social media. You can criticize Facebook all you want, but it really helped me find my voice. And the Male Breast Cancer Coalition and you, sir, are the ones that gave me my voice, and I'm thankful for it. So <laughs> that and my family and the hobbies and things that give me joy in life, that really helps. It really does help. So I'll, 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 I'll jump in to follow up on that. Um, and for me personally, exercise has always been... Um, a huge release and, and a great way for me to manage uh, depression. Um, I mean, sometimes to the extent of not um, seeking professional help or seeking medication um, in, in past years. But I think, um, I think exercise is hugely important. It's also hugely important we know now in helping to manage certain cancers like and prostate cancer, breast cancer, both fall into that category. Um, and the other thing that I just want to say on this score is not to be afraid of seeking medication. And the first medication that you, you take may not be the right medication. It certainly wasn't for me. So don't, don't take medication if you feel that you're, um, you're mentally unbalanced for whatever reason, including your, your, your cancer diagnosis and you take a medication and it doesn't work, then try another one. Work with your, work with your doc and, until you find something that, that, that balances you. But, but don't be afraid of medication. It, it, it's your friend, not your enemy. I want to touch on like the faith aspect of how getting through like traumatic events for me. That was one thing that was really important for me was you know, relying on my faith and the relationships that I have, because one of the first questions we ask ourselves is why did this happen to me? And that's a question that we can just let linger for a tremendous amount of time. And for me, you know, it was through the, the communication that I had with, um, with our church partners, with people that would really just reach out and like pray for the situations that we had going on, my health all along the way. And I ended up establishing more of a, a positive community because we've all know we've had people come try to give you a, advice on what to eat, not to eat, all those things like that, the different medications that may or may not work for people because they're trying to help. But at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's still on you for, to make the right decisions. Um, exercise is a really important thing for me as well too, to, to manage the stress. And I remember when you're, when you're going through chemo and your radiation, I couldn't even carry my own groceries up the steps, much, much less exercise fully. But it may be a walk around the neighborhood or a walk to the mailbox a couple of times. Um, and then you kind of work yourself, you work your way up um, as you go into survivorship and your health, um, just whatever your limitations are. And I think too, like humor is really important as well. Um, you know, a lot of us guys, we, we, we're into the fantasy football stuff or we play, you know, competitive sports with our friends and it's totally okay for my friends to make fun of me for having cancer. We're to that point now where, um, if someone beats me at something, they, someone made a joke one time and it was kind of awkward to everybody. They were waiting to see if I would laugh, but, um, like, Hey, Truett, I, I beat you just like you beat cancer or something like that. And, um, 
so I think it's, it's important to have that healthy communication with, with everyone in your community. You know, if you, if you're, if you practice um, a certain um, religion or faith, I think that's very important as well too, because some people can run away from that when something bad happens, but I'd say lean in towards that. And then, you know, just the exercise thing as well too, just to really help to manage the day-to-day -day stress. Got a lot of great strategies here. Kyle, as we're coming to wrap up our panel here, anything to add? Um, I think the only thing that I would add is um, I'm, I'm still working on accepting that uh, my mental health issues are something that I'm probably going to live with my entire life. But um, I think accepting that and accepting that it's a process and that it's um, that just life itself is ever changing and you're going to go through ups and downs. Um, but the importance of just to keep going and you've probably handled it in the past so you can handle it in the future you can handle it right now um that's one thing that i've been working on recently um and it's been important to uh my mental health yeah very very well said well we are unfortunately actually one minute over but i'm the host now so i'm just not going to end the recording um so guys we wrap up first of all i do want to say thank you uh, guys so much um, I know we're all located in various different time zones but as we wrap up here I do want to give each of you an opportunity to just let our panelists or I guess we are the panelists let our attendees know um, where we can find you um, on the internet preferably don't give out your street address that would probably go bad I mean you can if you want it's you, you're an adult you can make that decision for yourself so um, I see Rick has unmuted himself, so he's going to start. Yeah, even if I gave you my street address, I'm not sure you'd find me. Um, yeah, we're at ancan.org. That's Alpha Nancy Charlie Alpha Nancy ancan.org, um, and we run 17 virtual groups a month. We're expanding uh, through it. I'm hopeful we're going to have a, uh, a colon cancer group starting pretty soon. Uh, and anybody wants to get hold of us, they can do that through the website. Uh, and we're, we're happy to work with any of you to start a group for your particular uh, cancer or chronic disease. Go ahead, Trey. So you can check out the 1percentpodcast.com. That's the website for the show. The podcast is on iTunes. Spotify, pretty much every podcast outlet that's out there, YouTube, all those different things. But I think there's a tremendous amount of healing, like I said earlier, in storytelling. And everyone has a voice who has cancer or who takes care of someone with cancer. And it's really important for everyone's voice to be heard. So if you'd like to be a guest on the show, you can email me at info at 1percentpodcast.com. Like I said, check out 1percentpodcast.com. Uh, the website, all the different episodes we've had. We've have just had our 60th episode come out this past week. So um, definitely check us out, 1percentpodcast.com. And just to clarify, Trua, is one spelled out or is it new, with the number? Uh, it's spelled out, O-N-E. Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure. John, Kyle, don't all jump at once. Um, I don't really... The only thing I have is a Facebook page. Uh, I really want to connect with you guys, Truett. Rick, I love your, your uh, admonishment. Take your meds, don't be afraid of them. Absolutely true, Kyle. Uh, so you can find me on Facebook uh, if you want to you know, invite me. I'll say, hey, and I want to connect because you guys have a lot of good programs going on. It'll help me. And uh, you can find me at uh, check15.org and on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at check1515 spelled out. I just put it in the um, discussion so it's easy to see. All right. Well, once again, oh, and I guess you can find me at avalsysensitumor.com would probably, I should probably say that at some point, um, or on Instagram, avalsysensitumor, Facebook, avalsysensitumor, abs.tc on Twitter because a ballsy sense of humor was two characters too long for Twitter. 
Um, but I have exceeded our time by four minutes. Sorry, Dave. Um, but this is what happens when you make me the host. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, for watching. Please con contact with us um, and reach out. All of all of attendees, thank you for taking the time. And make sure you check your balls, man boobs, prostate, colon, really any part of your body. Just, you know, strip down and make it an evening. But with that note... Uh, please don't send us the video of you doing that. That would be quite uncomfortable. But I'm going to stop talking now. So everybody have a great rest of your evening. <laughs> Bye.